The following Bloodstream Media podcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only. Speak to your healthcare provider about all medical and treatment decisions. Cheat Codes listeners, producer Patrick here. Episode 5 of Cheat Codes is coming up right now, but wanted to give you a quick heads up. There are some times in the episode where there's a bit of weird background noise or music. We had some issues when recording a couple of the segments. Nothing that should be too distracting, but I did just want to give you that heads up so you didn't think you were crazy if you were hearing a little something in the background at times. So please enjoy episode 5 of Cheat Codes, a sickle cell podcast from doctors Mike and Amar. Hello, Warriors. Welcome back to Cheat Codes, a sickle cell podcast with me, Dr. Z. And me, Dr. C. (laughs) Dr. C, it is awesome to have you here. We are riding a high from the November to remember. Two new drugs in sickle cell disease. We're in a good spot. We have a really exciting episode. All right, so we are going to start off with uh, what's buzzing in social media, where I'm going to get to shout myself out for doing a little analysis of how the Twitter looked during the November to Remember and uh, during Ash. Uh, we'll follow that up by hitting our Warriors with a word of the day. After that, Dr. Callahan is going to finish us off with uh, talking about one of the landmark trials that's going to change the way we talk about sickle cell disease. So we're going to stick with the Star Wars theme. Last, last episode was episode four, A New Hope, and this is Return. Adak. Uh, the Adakvio strikes back. I love it. I love it. All right, guys, stay tuned for a really good episode. All right, Dr. Zadie, we are at the part of the episode where we talk about uh, what is happening now. So uh, what's going on on the Facebooks and the Snapchats? Well, Dr. Callahan, I, um, you know, I'm going to be a little bit selfish for this segment. I'm going to talk about myself. Can I do that? You're all over Twitter, so it's fitting. (laughs) Well, so what I want to talk about today is uh, sort of a characterization that I try to do of a really important piece in time for, for the sickle cell world. You know, I keep saying this was the November to remember, November 2019. November 15th, we get the approval of Chris and Lizamab, Adakvio, and November Easy for you to say. <laughs> and November twenty fifth, we get the approval for Voxelator Oxbrida, and that was unbelievable in a span of ten days to have that happen in a disease space where really nothing had happened in the prior thirty years. We got two in 30 years and then two more in 10 days. Right. Isn't that unbelievable? So we had, we had Andari, of course, as you alluded to, come out a little bit earlier. And then these two come in the November to remember. So what I thought is, wouldn't it be cool to characterize in a little bit more formal way what the conversation was on Twitter around Oxbrida and Adakvio? And that's exactly what we did. And actually... You're a co-author on this abstract, Dr. Callahan. So what we did is we looked at the reaction of Twitter in the space of hashtag sickle cell from November 14th to December 14th. And the reason we did it that way is because that captured not only the two new drugs coming out, but that also captured ash, which for us is like, I mean, it's like uh, it's the Super Bowl. It's Coachella for hematologists, right? <laughs> Basically. Um, yeah, it's the Super Bowl. It's, it's everything. Um, that, is, that is the main event. Um, so the hope was that we would capture the discussion around Adakvio, Oxbrida, and Ash. And, and the results were very interesting. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting. Uh, I, I remember you sent over an abstract, and it had more graphs and figures than a USA Today article. And just as colorful with maps of the United States. So we use this uh, software called Simpler, which helps us analyze patterns in particularly Twitter. Um, and it was pretty neat, actually, um, Dr. Mike. We, we saw really clear increases, peaks, on the day of approval for both Adakvio and Oxbrida. Oxbrida had a little bit of a higher peak. Um, 
And then there was obviously a spike during the timing of the Ash meeting. So that makes sense. New Absolutely. drug comes out, people are talking about yeah. it on Twitter. Yeah. And talking about it at the meeting. So the cool part to me is, you know, I love to see how information flows in this sort of... So what I really enjoy about this is how information flows. I like to see the, the way knowledge sort of travels through the internet. And when you look at where the tweets were coming from, it really shows you the spirit of this global disease. So there was engagement from, of course, the United States, but also Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Canada, India, Tanzania, France, and Kenya, and that's an order. So you can see that the countries that we know um, are afflicted mostly with sickle cell disease are, are actively participating in this quest, this journey for knowledge and looking for it wherever they can find it. And, and to me, that's just special. Um, the... I never thought of that. You have an international conversation on Twitter. It doesn't matter if you're in Kenya or Tanzania or... And how beautiful is that? I don't know about sickle cell in Canada, but uh, you're Canadian. So maybe, <laughs> maybe there um, are a few patients up there. Yeah, there must be, uh, there must be a, a pretty solid um, immigrant population, uh, particularly in the bigger cities like Toronto and Vancouver. You know, I that you're exactly right. That to me is like, that. that is everything. It's... How do we remove barriers for patients to access knowledge, right? Like what are the odds of a kid in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania sitting at his computer thinking about sickle cell disease and, and, and reading your tweet about Oxbrita, right? I mean, what, what, is, what is the chance that he hears about Oxbrita just, you know, otherwise going about his life on the day it comes out probably very little right and i and i love the fact that we can remove those barriers with these types of mediums so we went a little bit deeper into that and we looked at who 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 are the users and out of all the users about one fifth of them were physicians so physicians are, are participating in this discussion which makes it even a little bit more special um there was a good proportion of advocacy groups to the tune of 8 10% in that range. So Twitter knows all this about us. So this simpler program is, is something else. It is something else. Um, it, they, they really have an ability to capture things that I was surprised they could. Um, and, and we presume that there were 40, about 40% 40 of patients with possible sickle cell disease is the closest we could get. I can't confirm if they're warriors, but it seemed as though they were. And then we were able to capture the tone. So were the, was the sentiment, the feeling around this, was it positive? Was it negative? What is? What are we seeing? And what we find is that the positivity or the positive sentiment amongst physicians was about 75%. From advocacy groups, about 79%. And from the warriors, 61%. That's interesting. It'd be really cool to see how that changes over time. You know, as, as people get to use the medicines, are those sentiments different? Yeah, so, so I, I absolutely agree. I think, that it's, um, I think that these are really interesting metrics that really allow us to find out what conversations are happening and how impactful those conversations can be. Now, of course, within the United States, the states that were most active in the discussion um, on hashtag sickle cell were um, California, New York. Um, interestingly, Massachusetts um, was a little bit ahead of Texas and Florida. I don't know. I don't know who's in Boston that's tweeting that much or in Massachusetts, I should say, but um, besides Massachusetts, that profile really fits what we know of sickle cell disease in this country, which is California, I'm, which is that um, California, New York, Florida, and Texas have large numbers of patients. Um, so that's what I have for you in our segment today, Dr. Mike. 
Well, that's really interesting. So where are you going to go with this? How are you going to use these tools in the future? And, and what can Twitter tell us about how we should use sickle cell drugs or how people are talking about it? So I think that I, I, and I, and I tell this to everybody who asks me about social media, you know, oftentimes I have people come to me and say, I lack depth in my quest for social media knowledge. They're wrong. (laughs) I agree with you because I think that, you know, with physician, um, with physicians, historically, the way you connect with patients has been physical exam, long detailed histories, but the patient in 2020 is very different than the patient from 1920. And I really feel strongly about the fact that to really connect with your patient, you have to be in their phone. And if you're not in their phone, you're not really going to connect with them because this is a different patient. We have to evolve our, ourselves and our, um, understanding to, to account for the fact that this is a completely new generation that is, um, got a short attention span that is, um, just overloaded with information from all angles. Their phone is constantly going off. There's honestly, if you, if you don't have ADD, you're probably not paying enough attention is basically what it is at this point. I mean, it's like, it's like we're constantly walking around in like a casino. There's like lights and buzzing things and flashing things going off constantly. Sorry, what were you saying? I was checking Facebook. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So we, we really, I think that the future here is really in monitoring these discussions and making sure we're contributing to them as physicians to make sure that we are giving patients a chance at getting real information, just like we're doing with this podcast. I mean, this is all this is, is a quest to reduce barriers to knowledge. See, haters, that's deep. (laughs) Thanks, Dr. Zaidi. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, Warriors, we are back with our Warrior Word of the Day segment with Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike breaks down really important terms that you're going to hear in clinic and from providers and often from each other. Um, terms that you guys should probably be familiar with um, and, and really understand well. So, Dr. Mike, we've got a we've got a good one today. E- every word is a good one, I feel like, uh, but this one is particularly important to sickle cell disease and sickle cell disease patients uh, because this is something that causes quite a bit of problems when you have sickle cell disease. Uh, this term uh-huh. can cause pain, can cause stroke can cause all sorts of issues. This is really one of the major issues in abnormal red blood cells of sickle cell disease. So the word I have for you today is adhesion. Adhesion, all right. That's a good one. I like it. So adhesion is a medical term, but it's also a term we use all the time uh, when we're talking about tape, maybe adhesive tape. And really, in the medical context, it means something very similar. Um, It's talking about cells sticking um, or adhering to. Um, And I I guess to take a step back, why would cells stick? Um, So there are different situations where you want the cells to stick. Um, If you have a blood vessel and it breaks and the blood's under pressure and it's leaking out, you need to fill that hole. So... There are some times when you have adhesion and it's normal and it's appropriate. Um, in that case, you would have some proteins come in that help clot the blood. They would bring in platelets that would adhere there and they would make a plug to fill the hole and stop the bleeding. Other times you may have an infection outside of the blood vessel and some uh, inflammatory uh, response is needed to fight that infection. Sure. So you get um cells outside the blood vessel sending messages that say we need some white blood cells to come in here and fight and so one thing that happens is then the blood red blood cells uh, and the white blood cells they stick to the blood vessels so the blood vessels put out these things called selectins and the blood cells stick to those selectins and they have some cellular adhesion molecules they'll roll along the blood vessels 
and then find a spot where they can slip through, get out into the tissue and fight the infection. Cool. So those are all normal things. Yeah. But um, as is often the case in sickle cell, those normal things that usually help you um, can become problems. So in sickle cell, when you have sickling and you have hemolysis um, and you have uh, these deformed red blood cells, you get damage to the membranes. So the membrane is sort of the bag on the outside of the red blood cell. And when the hemoglobins line up and form these polymers, that's when the cells take on that sickle shape. Yeah, that and they crescent get hard. Shape. Exactly. Yeah. And we think of that membrane as just a bag, but the bag has a lot of different molecules in there that have different roles. Yeah. And one of them is called phosphatidylserine or PS. Uh -huh. And usually it's supposed to be on the inside because it's really sticky. And you don't want it on the outside because it'll, it'll stick to proteins. It'll... Uh, cause problems and when the membranes start to get damaged those flip to the outside and that makes the cell sticky and it adheres to the blood vessels we also have because the sickle cells are causing uh, blockage and you're getting decreased oxygen to areas and some tissues dying we have inflammation there and it turns on the same pathways that we use to fight infections it increases those selectins and those adhesion molecules that are there to cr cap capture the white blood cells and have them adhere and come in and fight an infection and yeah. clean up the uh, damage but in this case those blood vessels stick they slow the blood flow enough that the red blood cells sickle inside the tiny blood vessels and you get blockage wow. so adhesion can be a bad guy in sickle cell like a traffic though. jam kind exactly of. Yeah. exactly like wow. the the cells are getting stuck to the road and, and they can't uh, can't get by and you get a traffic jam there and then you can't make any deliveries yeah. down the road. Yeah, exactly. Dr. Mike, um, is it reasonable to think of like the way that these cells stick to blood vessel walls similar to sort of Velcro? I like that. You know, I, I think usually there's no uh, Velcro there on either side. It's smooth. They're slipping along. But when you have this inflammation and you have these changes to the sickle cells, they stick out uh, fuzzy stuff on the red blood cells yeah. and the little plastic sharp stuff on the, <laughs> yeah. on the blood vessel cell, and they stick together. Right. And then you got that traffic jam. Yeah. I like that. Um, so we've always known that this adhesion happens, but um, until recently there wasn't a whole lot we could do about it. Um, our friend Patrick Hines, who's... Uh, um, a, just a great guy. Great guy. Yeah. Um, Smart. Has a cool thing going here in Detroit. Absolutely. He's got a startup company that uh, is making a blood test that looks at adhesion. So we haven't had good tests to figure out why people's blood sickling or when we do things, if we can prevent it. But he's able to measure that. So he has a machine that basically makes like a fake little blood vessel and you can pump blood cells through it. Right. And he makes them glow different fluorescent colors and you can measure how well they're sticking. Yeah. And um, if there's too much sticking, then that's been shown to be correlated with problems with sickle cell. So people who have too much sticking in Patrick's test, they have more pain episodes. They have more complications from sickle cell. So Very we can cool. measure it. And now we also have some tools that we can used to stop the adhesion. So we Absolutely. have a new medicine that uh, we're talking about today, a DACVO that uh, inhibits some of those select and some of those Velcros that stick up on the blood vessel right. um, that the, the sickle cells stick to and the white blood cells stick to. So now we have things that can target adhesion. We can measure adhesion. So, so cool. So cool. We're, we're definitely seeing a real shift of, of the way we talk about sickle cell disease now, which is just amazing and fills me with optimism it's great we didn't have this two years ago so. yeah it's really really cool all right guys there you go word of the day from dr mike adhesion and now for the episode five interview segment this month it is with amit malik the executive vice president and head of oncology in the u.s for novartis and dr mimi heisinga the head of u.s oncology medical for novartis All right, here we go. Great. Well, welcome to uh, 
cheat codes. We have a couple of special guests from um, Novartis who um, are working on a DACVO, the drug we've been talking about all day. Um, so why, why don't I uh, have you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Amit Malik. I'm the Executive Vice President and Head of Oncology uh, for the U.S. for Novartis. And hi, I'm Dr. Mimi Heisinga, and I'm Head of U.S. Oncology Medical. Wonderful. So, so Amit and Mimi, we are um, just thrilled to have you guys on the podcast. And, um, you know, as you guys know, this is a podcast geared towards patients and, and really letting patients know what's out there. And of course, you guys really put a flag on the map in November of 2019, not too long ago, with, um, with a new drug in sickle cell disease. And it's amazing that we're having these conversations. Um, so, 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 so really, what we want to talk about today is, is this flag on the map. And, um, what Adacvio is, and, and we sort of wanted to hear a little bit about the Adacvio story from you and how we ended up with an approval in November. No, I'm happy, happy to talk to you about that. Uh, we're really excited uh, because, you know, as you may be aware, Navars has been advancing care for individuals with sickle cell for many years. And we started about 50 years ago when we had the first, uh, the world's first medicine for iron toxicity. And that helped to treat the iron overload that can occur when people receive blood transfusions for sickle cell. Um, and over decades, we continued on behalf of the people living with sickle cell uh, to continue to improve um, our iron, iron chelators and refine them. And, and that was the way we could support patients. But we knew, and we still know, there's such a high amount of need with, um, for people living with this condition. We know that it can impact the, you know, people's ability to perform in school, pursue a career, have a family, maintain relationships, and it can take a real emotional toll. And we know that the hallmark of the disease is all centered around sickle cell pain crises, which, as you guys know, are associated with life-threatening complications as well. And I have to tell you, just for me personally, getting into the space now and hearing the stories with people living with disease about the pain crises, it's just, it's devastating. I mean, I've heard people describe the pain as having a dump truck sitting on their body, as stabbing, or even you know, just asking doctors to take away whatever part of their body that hurts. And so just hearing that is obviously, you know, gut-wrenching to hear patients have to go through that sort of pain. So we wanted to really go after the the cause of of these pain crises, um, which is what Adacvio does. Um, so we're really excited about the medicine because it really helps to reduce the burden of pain uh, and reduce the frequency of these uh, pain crises. And we think it's a major advancement in treatment. And and we hope it can really help a lot of people living with the, the condition. Yeah, we, we talked today on the episode about the SUSTAIN trial, and we went through some of the data there. Um, but would you mind explaining real briefly how the drug works? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, of course, I'm sure you've already reviewed that the um, adoxia reduces the sickle cell pain crises by nearly half, um, down 45%. And it cuts the number of days that individuals that are living with sickle cell spend in the hospital because of their crises. But when I think about how, uh, you know, talking to people about how a DACVO works, and um, it's important to know that sickle cell is not just uh, the sickling of the red blood cells. There are many other things that go along uh, with that disease. So there's chronic inflammation, and they also see a higher level of something called uh, P-selectin. It's a protein that is really a sticky factor within the blood. And of course, we need stickiness in the blood sometimes for clotting and for things like that. But in sickle cell, because of these, the higher level of that protein, when the blood vessels and the blood cells are sticky, they can cluster together and they can block the blood flow. And it's this blocked blood flow uh, that actually leads to the acute episodes of pain that we call sickle cell pain crises and other life-threatening complications. So Adaxio actually attaches to the P-selectin protein, and it blocks the interaction between the protein and between these cells. So it decreases that stickiness that P-selectin causes. And so that's really, I think, the simplest way to think about how Adaxio um, works and how why it's so effective in preventing pain crises. We always try to come up with innovative ways to talk to patients about um, how drugs work and, and, and the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease. So sort of on this episode, we explored the analogy of a velcro and um you know the selectins being like little hooks of velcro that um, help grab onto stuff and, and adacvio working to sort of block that velcro but you know both of you guys have a reasonable amount of, of, of uh, quite a bit of uh, clinical experience so just to get your your sort of take on it if you were in um, a room with a patient talking about adacvio how would you explain um, in terms for them how this drug is actually um, working 
Yeah, I, I actually really like the Velcro example. I've talked about it helping the cells or red blood cells become some more slippy uh, so that it's able to go past each other and not adhere to each other, creating those blockages. The other important thing around P-selectin, although I don't necessarily recommend going there first, um, but it increases the inflammation. So if you think about uh, when you hurt your knee or when you have a cut, you get um, a red area around it as your body is healing. Uh, that's a good thing. P-selectin calls in the white blood cells. Um, but in sickle cells, because we have higher levels of P-selectin, we get more and more of these white blood cells in that cause inflammation. And so we have an accelerated inflammation response. And so when I talk to patients, in addition to the red blood cells, uh, being able to slip past each other more easily or not adhere like on a Velcro model. The other part of it is it, it causes um, a reduction in that red, angry kind of inflammation that happens on the inside of the bodies that the patients can't see. So we, we talked um, about the sustained trial and, and looking at pain episodes. What are the next steps for a DACVO? Do you guys have other investigations in the pipeline? Definitely. Um, so sickle cell is something, as Amit was describing, we're in for the long haul, and we're excited to bring new innovations forward in sickle cell. But uh, there's so much more that we want to learn about a DACVO. So I mean, when we were designing these studies, part of the challenge is understanding the natural course of the disease uh, and how end organ damage comes about. You know, how is it tied to pain uh, crises? It really what happens to the body during the sickle cell uh, episodes. And so we're studying um, a couple of things. So we're exploring a DACVO in a pediatric indication, and we're also looking at it as, uh, at the end organ damage and how it might protect against end organ damage. And that's part of our Century Clinical Trial Program. So we have five clinical trials looking at the benefit and safety of the DACVO in both children and then also looking at um, end organ damage. So things like priaprism, uh, kidney complications, and we're exploring other end organs to look at as well. That's 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 wonderful to hear. Um, you know, it's going to be very important going forward that um, we can make a meaningful impact in some of those um, sort of, especially priapism. That 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 really is um, very interesting to me. So hopefully, a DACVO can show um, good benefit in that trial. So tell us a little bit about. You know, patients always ask us, "Am I going to be able to get this medication? What are the steps? How do I, you know, how do I get this this new?" Um, sort of therapeutic option. Tell us a little bit about how, how you guys are working to partner with providers and patients to make getting a DACVO a little bit easier. Yeah, so no, it's, a, it's a great question because it's only as beneficial as patients can actually get access to it, and, and that's absolutely key. So we're working with private and public payers to ensure that we have widespread access as soon as possible. And I have to say we're making really good progress because, you know, as, you, as you guys know, we have patients that have commercial insurance, others that have Medicare, and others that have Medicaid. So we want to make sure that all, all of those patients get coverage. So far, we've already seen several states uh, publish coverage, uh, positive coverage in terms of Medicaid policies for ADACVO um, with, with coverage consistent with a label, which I think is really, really good. And we've also had a number of big national private insurers like United Healthcare and Anthem who are also have put formal policies in place. Uh, I think these are good signs, and, and we're already seeing a lot of movement in general from other states and other private payers as well. Uh, but we know that getting access is, goes beyond even just payer coverage. We're committed to supporting individuals living with sickle cell disease to begin the treatment once they've been prescribed it by their doctor. So we have a, um, a big service called Adaptive Support at Pano, which offers resources and support designed specifically to help patients uh, with that process. So the program offers uh, help to un helping to understand the insurance coverage and financial responsibilities throughout the insurance beneficiation process, help to identify infusion sites covered by um, the person's insurance plan, information about financial assistance that may be available. Patient support counselors were able to provide information uh, in more than 160 languages, and one single point of contact to help guide people throughout the process and getting access to Adacvio. So this is a program that's available to anyone prescribed Adacvio by their doctor, uh, and I think it's gonna help patients uh, beyond all the work we're doing to get payer coverage to navigate the system to, to ensure that they can really get the benefit of the medicine uh, if prescribed by their doctor. And I just wanted to add that um, Adaxia was studied in patients with all sickle cell genotypes, and it's effective in, uh, and indicated for all of the genotypes. In addition, it uh, also shows benefit for patients with sickle cell whether or not they are taking hydroxyurea. 
And so sometimes uh, those can become barriers to access um, or for prescribing purposes. And so it's important to know that any genotype and with or without hydroxyurea. Uh, I should also note that adoxio is indicated for people living with sickle cell who are 16 years or older. And of course, there are always important safety considerations and patients should speak to their doctor uh, about adoxio if they're interested in it. You know, the last sort of piece of this interview that I just want to touch base on is, you know, of course, the burden of this disease is, is global. And, um, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, India and Pakistan have a tremendous amount of patients that, that suffer from sickle cell disease. Tell us a little bit about your efforts to help expand access to this medication into, into really those regions that are suffering most. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we have a, a, about 100,000 patients living with this, you know, horrible condition in the United States. Uh, but many more patients around the world. So just to pick Africa as an example, there's 4 million people living with uh, sickle cell in Africa, another million in India. So there's, there's, there's a lot of patients around the world that could, could benefit from better care. So you may or may not know, but we have really a long-standing commitment to healthcare in Africa, uh, just as an example. We have a dedicated sub-Saharan Africa unit, which increases reach in this area. And we've been doing work in Africa from a public health standpoint in areas like malaria, cancer, um, and other, other, a lot of other conditions. And most recently, we were really making a big push to support uh, people living with sickle cell. We know that the impact is really high. I mean, in fact, when you look at the average life expectancy of a, of a person living with sickle cell in the U.S., it's in the mid-40s, whereas it's only about five years old in, in um, Africa because they're oftentimes lacking even some of the basic treatments. So we uh, are trying to help with a number of different things. So providing some of the more basic treatments like hydroxyurea, um, trying to work with the government to make sure that um, there's a better newborn screening programs, that uh, people get access to things like vaccinations and antibiotics. So just, you know, we're playing a role in sort of a public-private partnership to make sure that we're providing some of the elements like hydroxyurea but also working on more comprehensive programs where uh, newborns and throughout their life, you know, people living with the, the, the disease can, can benefit. Um, <clears throat> now, we're starting with um, interesting work in Ghana, which Mimi can tell you more about, but then we plan to expand to many more countries in Africa and, and uh, around the world. Great. Thanks, Amit. Yeah, the Novartis Africa Sickle Cell Disease Initiative, um, which is a mouthful, but it's a very important program, and uh, the first wave of that program starts with a public-private partnership with the Ghana government and the Sickle Cell Foundation of Ghana. Uh, that partnership is aiming to improve diagnosis and treatment and is really looking at a comprehensive approach. Um, so in addition to the screening and diagnosis, treatment and disease management, we're also working on training and education and elevating basic and clinical research capabilities in sub-Saharan Africa. So, for example, uh, we're working on starting a crizolizumab, and that's the generic name for Adek Bayo is um, crizolizumab. We're starting trials uh, this year, and it's going to be the first time that a biologic therapy that's not a vaccine enters into multi-center clinical trials in sub-Saharan Africa. And so that uh, is a really exciting opportunity, but it means that we need to invest in these basic and clinical research capabilities. And we're making great progress. Just over a year ago, um, so around October of 2018, the Ghana FDA granted marketing, um, for, granted Novartis the ability to market hydroxyurea, and we've delivered more than 20,000 treatments to date. Yeah, and it's just the beginning. As I mentioned before, I mean, we're really aiming to establish a comprehensive model in Ghana, but that can expand to other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And we have a goal to reach multiple countries over the next couple of years. That's wonderful. That I'm I'm completely moved by the kind of work that you guys are doing to, to um, benefit uh, patients with sickle cell disease. Um, thank you, thank you both so much for taking time out of your schedules to make this happen. Um, and and we're really really looking forward to seeing um, how the story of sickle cell disease is going to change with uh, efforts of people like yourselves and, and Novartis and and drugs like Adacvio. Um, so thank you again for taking time to do this. That's wonderful. That I'm I'm completely moved by the kind of work that you guys are doing to to um, benefit uh, patients with sickle cell disease. Um, thank you, thank you both so much for taking time out of your schedules to make this happen. Um, and and we're really really looking forward to seeing um, how the story of sickle cell disease is going to change with uh, efforts of people like yourselves and then Novartis and and drugs like Adacvio. Um, so thank you again for taking time to do this. No, it's our pleasure, and thank you both so much for everything you're doing for, 
the patients. Um, and it's, it's just great to see the commitment that you have for not only the treatment, but also for education that's going to help patients. All right, Warriors, in our next segment, we are back with Dr. Mike, where we're going to be discussing a seminal trial that is going to change the way people are talking about sickle cell disease, even in your sort of clinic visits with your physicians. So uh, back in the 70s, um, they, they found that you could find the cells that make the individual uh, antibody and you could make um, you could make it grow and multiply and, and uh, be immortal and, yeah. and make lots of antibodies, but just that one specific one. So you could make tons and tons of antibodies that just target that one thing. So they call that a clone because all of the cells are, are exactly the same. the same. They're sure. making the same antibody. Um, and so these antibodies come from just one clone. So they're monoclonal. Um, and so you can make them to target anything. Cool. And uh, what they did in the past sometimes was they would inject something into a mouse or a goat or a rabbit and the rabbit or the mouse or the mouse or the ghost would make antibodies against it. They would find the cell that was and r really grow it up to make more of those antibodies. Sure. The technology's gotten better now. We can design them. We can uh, make them from DNA. Um, we can make them human-like so yeah. people don't have reactions to them. And we can really make them to target whatever we want. So in this case, they made one of these monoclonal antibodies to target P-selectin. Okay. And the idea is basically that it goes in and it sort of covers up the P-selectin so that uh, the red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets don't stick. In this study... Um, they enrolled people who had um, sickle cell and you could have SS um, or S beta zero um, sickle cell, but there were also um, other patients genotypes. with other genotypes. Okay. Um, so it was about 70% SS and about 30% other genotypes. They enrolled people who were 16 years of age and older and who were having pain episodes, so at least two pain episodes. Um, and about 63% of the patients had two to four pain episodes in the prior year, Yeah. and the rest had five to 10. Um, so really, people with quite a lot of pain. And so th they enrolled 198 patients um, at 60 different sites. So, so this is a pretty large Huge. Um, phase two trial. And they, they treated them with either the placebo or the drug at the two different doses for um, a total of 52 weeks. Okay. And over those 52 weeks, um, they kept track of how much pain people were having. And they found that the high-dose um, Adacvio um, had a much lower rate of pain episodes than the placebo. So awesome. there were 2.98 pain episodes per year in the placebo arm and 1.63 per year in the ADAC VO arm, um, looked at how many patients had zero pain episodes. Yeah. So I, I think that's what we want. We want our patients to Be get to having no comfortable. pain. Yeah. And in the ADAC VO group, 38% uh, had zero pain episodes in a year compared to 12% in the placebo. Amazing. That's, that's huge, Dr. Mike. I mean, it that, is. If you're one of that 25% of patients imagine? who, who benefit from this and have zero pain episodes because of it, I, I think that's huge. They also looked at some other secondary endpoints. So um, they looked at the number of days people were in the hospital uh, for a year. And in the placebo group, it was almost seven. Yeah. In the um, high-dose ADACVO group, it was four. They looked at how long it took before a person had a pain crisis. So yeah, the, the yeah. time from when they started until their first pain crisis. And in the placebo group, it was about one one point four months before they had their first pain crisis on average. So meaning from the time the study started, half of the people had a pain episode by 1.4 1. 1. 4 months. 4 months. Whereas in the group on the Adacvio, it was um, four months. That's crazy. And then they looked at the time to have your second pain episode. Yeah. And half of people in the placebo group had a second pain episode by month five. And in the Adacvio group, um, it wasn't until month 10. Amazing. Um, really so, amazing. So that was uh, both of those 
uh, the statistics showed that these were highly unlikely to happen by chance. So, so based on that really promising data, preventing yeah. 45% of pain Huge. episodes, um, in a phase two trial, randomized trial, multi-center trial, um, big phase two trial, um, FDA, um, gave a DAC VO, uh, fast track designation, reviewed it and approved it. Great. Um, but again, we need more, more data. Sure. Um, sure. L- uh, phase three studies underway. There are also other studies to look at these That's right. uh, specific endpoints in high-risk populations. So yeah. I know there's been reports of people using a dac specifically for people with leg ulcers yeah. um, or priapism. Sure, sure. Um, and so I, I think there are plans for specific studies to see if a dac um, really is effective in, in these settings and, and how do we use how do great. we use it. So, I mean, this is... Uh, this is that, that that's just a great discussion on um, the sustained trial for us clinically. Now, what this means is we have patients 16 and older who can benefit from, you know, and the way this looks in clinic is basically uh, patients come in outpatient. So um, not while they're admitted, but when they're sort of at home, they come to the clinic once. A, well, it starts at you get your first infusion. You get your second dose two weeks later, and then once a month from there. Right. And, um, you know, that is uh, also interesting. Um, You know, I think that um, that once a month IV infusion is interesting for a couple reasons. So I think there I think there's a there's two sides of the coin here. So one is it's not a daily medication. And you would think that maybe that drives adherence up because now the patient comes in, gets their medication for the month and they're done. On the other side, you could say, man, it's kind of a nightmare to go to clinic once a month and, 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 and try to get there, you know, every four weeks. Right. So th- this is something we talk about a lot. We, we say, we used to say compliance, yeah. we say adherence. And, and what we mean is, you know, do you take your medicine? Yeah. And I, uh, you know, a lot of us have trouble remembering to take our medicine all the time. Um, it's, it's, you know, I think there's different patterns. There's some people who are really good and they yeah. never miss a dose of anything. Yeah. Um, there are people who get busy or forget and they miss a dose here or there. There are people who go through good periods and bad periods. You know, I'm on my post new year's, uh, weight loss kick and I've been, <laughs> yeah. uh, I should take my fish oil and exercising and yeah. And rem- remembering to do all the things that take care of me. But, uh, you know, last year by March I had fallen off the wagon and, and had, uh, stopped. And I, I think some people are, uh, that way with their medical regimens. Yeah. They I agree. In good streaks and bad streaks. And I, I think, you know, there, there's a debate and I, I think it's probably different, different for different folks. Um, you know, for some people, being able to go in once a month, get it done, and not have to think about it again for a month means, you know, you, you're going to be able to be adherent and you're going to get the benefit right. from that. For other people, you know, taking a day off of work or school or transportation, it's not getting easy. to your appointment um, is not easy. And, the, you know, this medicine goes in over about a half an hour. Um, so hopefully not a, not a tremendously long appointment, but, uh, you know, anytime you have to go in and, and, uh, see the doctor and get an IV started, it's going to take some time. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's an issue that's a little bit under appreciated is this requires an IV start. Yeah. And sometimes it's not easy to get IVs in patients with sickle cell disease, but, uh, you know, nonetheless, I mean, I, I think that this is, a uh, really exciting exciting change and uh, a, a really wonderful option for a, for a lot of um, individuals again this does not constitute medical advice exactly. you really need to talk about this with your physician if one of us is your physician come talk to us um and and i want to i want to thank you again for for such a nice uh breakdown of uh the sustained trial <laughs> Well, this is the worst part of the show as far as I'm concerned. This is when we have to wrap up and I have to stop learning from you, Dr. Mike. That was a great show. and We'll have another one next week. I thought that was really productive. So hopefully you guys remember from the last episode, we have new Twitter handles. 
Make sure you follow us at Dr. Z Sickle Cell and at Imagineer. I'm going to point out that I also have a new Instagram at Dr. Z Sickle Cell. Share this podcast with somebody who you think could learn a little bit more about sickle cell disease. Make sure you keep following us for new content and continue to live well with sickle cell. Be healthy. Stay warm.